So uh, I want to welcome you to the American Cinematheque and to the Art Directors Guild's Film Society, Art Directors Film Society Screening Series. And uh, I first want to acknowledge that John Muto is here. And uh, John, where are you? John is the founder of the series. Many, how many years ago, John? Uh, in the 90s. In the 90s sometime. And that's all we need to say. And I also want to recognize that Tom Walsh, who couldn't be here today because he's shooting in New Mexico, I think, would also, is our, we are our three co-directors, I guess. How you can be co and be three, I don't know. Um, this is our series. I hope that you'll come and see our events, especially coming up the, uh, the beloved Rogue. You cannot miss it at the American Cinematheque at the Egyptian Theater. I mean, it's just, it's Sunday, May 22nd. John has put together a great program. And uh, then we have On the Waterfront, uh, June 26th, with, uh, we've decided to do something new this year, and it really was, uh, uh, John, I think this was your brainchild, about having designers that are, that are, you know, our major film designers, but what inspired them? What film inspired them? And so we reached out to Wynn Thomas, and he said, well, I'd like to show On the Waterfront and talk about that. So I think it's a kind of way of melding generations, which is how we came up with this film screening today. Uh, I also want to point out Sunday, July 31st at the Egyptian Theater. Um, might be here because who knows what they're doing with the Egyptian these days, meaning that uh, there, there's some renovation in the booth. Uh, Harold and Lillian, a Hollywood love story, which of course is about Harold Michelson and his wife, and uh, it's a art direction love story. Can I call it that? Production design love story? But it's a wonderful documentary, actually. And uh, there's this flyer if you want to pick it up. I, I want to speak a little bit first about the American Cinematheque, which is, this is our filmmakers theater here at the Arrow and at the Egyptian. I'm a member of the Art Directors Guild, but I also am a member and I pay my dues for the American Cinematheque, as should you. And I, it's a wonderful thing to do, so I, I think it's not very much money. Um, I'm going to speak a, just a few more minutes and then we're going to watch a clip. So then I will introduce our panelists and then we will have our discussion, which normally, if you've come to these in the past, we show the film and then we have the discussion. And this year we decided to do it differently for this program. So too many reasons why. But what I want to say is, uh, you know, a few years ago, like three years ago, Kalina Ivanov won the Art Directors Guild Award for Grey Gardens. And when she gave her acceptance speech, she said, I'd like to thank my mentor, Oliver Smith. And I looked around the ballroom at the Beverly Wilshire and I could see Stephen Olson. I could see a whole bunch of people, you know, more than eight or 10 that I thought, wow, this is interesting. There is this man who has, was a film designer as well as probably the greatest I could easily say the greatest Broadway designer ever. I mean, I don't think that's disputable. He won uh, 10 Tony Awards. He was nominated for over 25 or 23, and one of them was a special award given to him halfway through his career. There's seasons on Broadway where he had up to 12 shows running at once, which if you know there's only 33 Broadway theaters, that's a remarkable feat. Um, there was a story that Campbell Bear just told me that Nolan Scenic Studios actually built a cot in their truck for Oliver to sleep in because they had so many shows loading in around. They would just bring the cot out to the stage. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about Oliver. All, the, many, all of we all studied with Oliver at NYU at the Tisch School of the Arts. And I think it, we have to give credit to Lloyd Burlingame who had the presence of mind to say, I'm going to go after this guy who doesn't want to teach and see if he wants to teach. And there's a great story that after a couple of years of teaching, with, with all of the uh, budget cuts and stuff, the dean at, the, at what was not then called the Tisch School of the Arts, the School of the Arts, came to, to Lloyd and said, well, do you think we could get Oliver to work for half the money? <laughs> and so uh, Lloyd said, OK, I'll go ask him. He went, to, he went to Brooklyn to ask him in his brownstone. And, and Oliver said, well, that sounds terrific. I'll just teach half the classes. <laughs> so of course, they didn't make that deal. Um, uh, I, I don't, uh, you know, I've heard this, you know, I talked to John Berger, who's one of our members and a wonderful set designer and art director, and uh, Oliver had an uneasy association with Hollywood, and in fact, Campbell Bear told me yesterday that he even felt a little bit blacklisted in the end. He only did four major movies, and if only of us could ever do these four movies, right, which is Porgy and Bess, uh, Guys and Dolls, you'll see tonight, which he was nominated for an Oscar for, uh, Oklahoma and the, and the bandwagon. Uh, I think we would be happy with our careers if we only had four movies that we had designed. 
Um, all of, I, I, there's this wonderful book called The February House. And believe it or not, Oliver lived in this house on mid Street Street in, in Brooklyn. And he was, the, he was the cousin of Paul Bowles, the, the writer. And if you knew about this house, it, it was the most bohemian house in New York at the time. And unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore because it was raised for the extension of the BQE, which is the Br Br Brooklyn Queens Expressway. So the house doesn't exist. There's a wonderful photo in this book. Uh, this book actually was made into a musical that premiered at um, the public last year, short-lived, as most musicals are. But this book called The February House was called The February House because Oliver um, was born in February. Of course, I was born in February. And almost everyone that lived in the house, including, imagine, imagine these are your roommates in your house. W.H. Auden, Carson McCullers, Jane and Paul Bowles, Benjamin Britten, and Gypsy Rose Lee, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and among other people. Uh, and then, you know, when Oliver bought his brownstone in Brooklyn, where many of us had our final, you know, meal, you know, the, when we were graduating, uh, he, he, his basement apartment was used by Truman Capote to write in Cold Blood and several other things. So, so Oliver kind of lived in those circles. We'll tell a few more stories about that. But I do want to read this one, this one little bit about, because I was trying to find a concise history of Oliver. And Oliver, when he was at the Midhouse Street House, was, was the chief cook and bottle washer, basically. He lived in the attic, had his attic studio, and he kept the furnace going, and he did the dishes. And it said, um, uh, Oliver Smith's future was a happier one. After his work on Saratoga, uh, Pavel, I can't pronounce his name, Tetchikov, recommended him as set designer for the Ballet Russe production of Rodeo. Imagine your first big show is for the Ballet Russe at the Metropolitan, right? Um, and uh, it was choreographed by Agnes DeMille to Aaron Copeland's score. The Western Ballet came a smash hit and is still performed around the world. And if you look at the skies in Oklahoma, they, they are very similar to the skies he did for, um, for Rodeo. And um, Oliver worked with the brilliant young choreographer Jerome Robbins and the composer Lenny Bernstein on Fancy Free, which was a ballet story about a pair of na naive young sailors on shore leave in New York. Fancy Free, whose setting is at a waterfront bar, resembled a raucous sand, sand street haunts in Brooklyn, proved enormously successful and was soon transformed to the musical On the Town. It was subsequently made into the hit Hollywood film in 1945, Carson wrote to Reeves in Amusement, quote, Oliver Smith has produced a show called On the Town, which is the most successful comedy in many years. The, the critics agree that it is the best of its kind of any, of, in ages, and now suddenly he is wallowing in wealth. Two weeks ago, he couldn't pay George the rent. Smith earned enough money from that play and, and the film to buy a 28-room yellow br brick Brown Brooklyn Heights mansion in Willow Street, which he had long admired. There he recreated the Meadow Street Attic Studio, invited as house guests such artists as Truman Capote, uh, who, who would write Breakfast and Tiffany and Cold Blood in Oliver's basement, and rested between such culturally defining design and production projects as Brigadoon, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, West Side Story, My Fair Lady, Flower Drum Song, Camelot, Hello Dolly, Oklahoma, Guys and Dolls, The Sound of Music, and most of... Um, you know, like uh, Plaza Suite and most of Neil Simon's plays on Broadway. So, uh, and uh, he later remarked that West Side Story had been inspired by the walks he and Jerome Robbins used to take under the Brooklyn Bridge and down by the docks. Consequently, he confided to a reporter that the set for the show was really more Brooklyn than Manhattan, but don't tell anyone. So, um, the fir the, 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 of these four films, I'm going to give a brief introduction, but I will tell you the most troubling one is Porgy and Bess. And Porgy and Bess was the last film that Oliver did together. And after we screen uh, um, Guys and Dolls, I'm going to show two or three minutes of a, of a sequence, a beautiful sequence that shows almost all of Oliver's sets for Porgy and Bess. The problem is there's no good print. There's no good copy. The copy that we got is actually looks like it's a, a bad DVD transfer of a VHS tape. It's so blurry. But Porgy and Bess is an incredibly troubled project because what had happened with it was it was uh, it turned out to be Sam Goldwyn's last produced project in Hollywood, and he had already left MGM. So while it was produced on the Metro lot, 
Oliver had not been in Hollywood for five years and was, was lured back uh, after his first three films. And what happened with Porgy and Bess was that uh, Ruben Mamoulian was directing it and they had done a wonderful thing and Oliver had based the palette on German and Northern Italian painters of the Renaissance and it was gorgeous. I mean, it was, it's the, the, see, the sets they built are gorgeous and they even built a little bit of a, a, of a lagoon. And it all takes place in Catfish Row. Uh, and what happened is that it's a, it's a hard story to kind of get all the pieces, but Harry Belafonte was supposed to be Porgy, and he felt that it was too much of a stereotype. Sam Goldwyn had taken 11 years to get the rights because the Gershwins really didn't want a film made of it. So now the Gershwin estate, after both Gershwins had died, said, well, okay, we'll give you the rights. He had the rights, and he called Oliver, and he says, I really want you to do this, and it'll be easy. He got uh, Irene Sharaf to do the costumes, and, uh, and they came out, and they did this, and uh, they had Sidney Poitier play Porgy, who couldn't sing, and this is one of the reasons that the Gershwin estate doesn't like the film at all, and all the recitatives that had been, because Porgy and Bess is an opera, but there was a, a very well-received revival of Porgy and Bess, um, maybe five years after it originally premiered on Broadway, where they took out the recitatives and did, spoke it as dialogue. So Sam Goldwyn said he wanted to do that version. They gave him permission. He hired Mamoulian. They built these sets. And there was two days before shooting, and all the sets and all the costumes burnt to the ground. So we can all imagine, being filmmakers, what that would mean. So what happened is, uh, at another cost, personally to, to Sam Goldwyn, of $2 million, it took six weeks to rebuild all the sets. But by that time, Mamoulian had been fired, or let go, and uh, Otto Preminger, who was one of the producers, had decided to direct the film, and Sam Goldwyn had let him. So the first thing that Otto Preminger did is come in, and all the beautifully, beautiful sets that Oliver had done, he basically whitewashed them. He said, I'm worried about seeing these dark faces against all this color, and I, I want it to be very stark. And Oliver took one look at it and left, and he said, that's it, I'm not doing this. So they started shooting, and some of those shots are actually in the film because they didn't reshoot things. Uh, and you'll see in the clip here, and the whitewashing is really painful, but if you do see photographs of it, which you saw in the slideshow, it's glorious color, right? And um, Oliver was also at the very early stages of both Cinemascope and Todd A.O., so the film you're seeing today, Guys and Dolls, is shot in Cinemascope, and it's a DCP print, and it's glorious. And Oliver was nominated for Guys and Dolls. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting problem about Guys and Dolls, because both Guys and Dolls, Oklahoma, and uh, you know, are, are very famous set designs to those of us in the theater. We know Lemuel Ayer's sets for Oklahoma. We know Melziner, Joe Melziner's sets for um, for Guys and Dolls, but Oliver had to reinterpret them and in some ways made them his own, very much. So I think that uh, you will see in this clip from Bandwagon is Oliver was the synergistic connection of the Broadway theater and fantasy. And fantasy was a big word for Oliver. And, and he was known for his skies, both his skies in ballet and his skies in opera and his skies. And all, all today when you're seeing all this work, I want you to think about the sky is painted by a real artist. Oliver uh, went to architecture school uh, at Penn State and wasn't that interested in being in the, in the theater until he got to New York. He had met, uh, at Penn State, he had met Lee Simonson, who said, maybe you don't want to be an architect. Maybe you're better at this. He'd taken a scene design class and designed some school plays. And Lee Simonson said, well, maybe you should just go to New York and try being a set designer. And, uh, and he fell in, imagine just falling in with the likes of these early collaborators like Jerome Robbins. Uh, Lucia Chase asked him to be co-director of the American Ballet Theater. And Oliver was co-director of the American Ballet Theater for 35 years and designed all these shows on Broadway and did these five musicals, uh, four musicals in, uh, in Hollywood. And I remember when we were at school and Baryshnikov had just stepped down being the, the director of American Ballet Theater, there was Oliver back in his 70s, you know, 60s, he died at 75, being the director again of the American Ballet Theater for a few years. So he had incredible stamina and he worked very quickly. And uh, I feel that Bandwagon, 
you know, he, it was his first film, and I think in many ways his greatest design achievement in this kind of synergy of transferring. Because when they started working on Bandwagon, there was uh, Betty Comden and Adolph Green, who were Broadway um, composer and lyricist, who were out at the Arthur Freed unit at, at MGM, who were, they were hiring everybody from, from New York. Um, Mel Ziner had just come out and done Picnic and had a very unsatisfying you know, experience, and so he had gone back, and that's one reason that Oliver did Guys and Dolls. But, um, but there was a lot of Broadway people actually in Hollywood at the time, and so you see the early golden age of Broadway musicals kind of transferring to the golden age of Hollywood musicals, and Oliver is that incredible link, and uh, he worked very closely with set decoration, and he was originally hired to do a Gene Kelly movie that was gonna be shot in Europe. And he went to Sam Goldwyn and said, Sam, I don't want to do that. I want to stay here and learn about the movie business. So uh, Comden and Green were already in Hollywood at, at MGM writing Bandwagon, which had a different title then. And, and, uh, and so he decided to stay and do that. And Michael Kidd was the uh, choreographer, and he had known him because he had hired him at American Ballet Theater. So a lot of these American Ballet Theaters so a couple of things I want you to look for in this clip that we're going to show. It's going to take about, I forget how long the clip is. It's 10, or 10, or 10 minutes or so. But during the show, it's very episodic towards the end because they, it's sort of the backstage story of a Hollywood star played by Fred Astaire, who is now washed up. And he decides to go back to New York to uh, do a musical. So they hire this guy who's played by a British actor. Uh, who's playing, you'll see he's playing Oedipus, and they hire him to direct this show. Well, Compton and Green and Oliver and all of the people involved used a lot of their experiences from different Broadway shows kind of put into this. So I, I've picked a few sequences. A couple things I want you to look at is the, the scene, uh, at the end of the movie, they fix the musical, but they go on tour. They go to Philadelphia and New Haven and all this, and they add in all these new numbers. So it's almost like a vaudeville show, which Bandwagon originally was when it was produced on Broadway. So it's all these different gags and different scenes, and it is a designer's tour de force. You will see in the title card that Oliver did not get credit as production designer, partly because of what's now our union. I don't remember the number then, uh, 871 or whatever. And uh, they said, well, you can't be credited because you're not in the union. Same thing many of us faced over the years. So he gets credit as musical numbers designed by Oliver Smith. And the art director on the movie said, no, 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 he did the musical numbers and I did the real numbers. And then when they did an interview with the set decorators, they said, no, Oliver picked everything. We just did that to get around the union. So I find that to be very funny, and I, I, I wish one day we could restore Oliver's credit, except everybody knows that. And you will see, it's, there's no moment in the show that is not a musical number. So that's what's so crazy about that title, if you ever see this movie. There's no book scenes. It's all musical number to musical number to musical number. But you will see that Oliver was considered one of the three great colorists of Broadway, the others being Joe Melziner and uh, Donald Onslager. And Oliver used color, I think we can all agree, there's no one who could use color. No one that could put yellow and pink and green and make it just this most incredible palette. And what, what he gives, though, I think in all these films, even in Porgy and Bess, is he gives permission for the music to happen. He gives permission for the singing to happen. But, and, and I feel sad because, you know, right after this, this is 1959, very much after this, they, just, they did the filming of West Side Story. And uh, in fact, when you look at his credits, um, just to think about what he was doing between these movies, for example, when he did Paint Your Wagon in, in 53, in 52, I mean, in, when he did the bandwagon, the movie in 53, he, uh, the year before he had done, 1949, Gentlemen Prefer, Prefer Blondes on Broadway, 1951, Paint Your Wagon, 1952, Pal Joey on Broadway, then, then 53 is Bandwagon, then he goes back to Broadway and does Carousel and On Your Toes, among four other shows, then he does Oklahoma and Guys and Dolls back to back, both films. Then he comes back to New York and does My Fair Lady, Auntie Mame, Candide, La Traviata at the Met, and then in 57, West Side Story, right? Among eight other shows. Then he goes back after doing Flower Drum Song on Broadway to do Porgy and Bess. And, um, and Campbell said Porgy and Bess kind of made him, the problems with Porgy and Bess kind of made him 
uh, Oliver told Campbell that he said he felt blacklisted in Hollywood, but I also know that Hollywood changed. I mean, if you look at what happened in Hollywood from 59 to 60, the studios were basically gone by then, or at least the way the Arthur Freed unit produced. And I think that Oliver found this golden niche where he could do these musicals and preserved, you know, in, in many ways preserved much of the choreography that's in these. So there's the history lesson. I don't want to bore you with too much more of that, but, but as you can see, I'm very, very thrilled and excited um, to be here. I have some prints of some Oliver sketches here, and, and we can all attest that he was a, a sort of a genius. Uh, rooting around in a flea market in New York a couple of years ago, my agent happened to find this Oliver sketch uh, basically for sale for a few dollars, and uh, it's the original for um, 1973. It was nominated for a Tony for Gigi, and it's the act curtain for Gigi. And it's Oliver's signatures on the back and the front. And, uh, and then just the other day on eBay, I found this postcard, which I will not tell you how much I spent. But I will tell you that it is, it is a moment in time, and it's sort of Oliver walked with these giants. It said, it's from Fez in Morocco. It's 1948. It says, Dear Carl. Carl was this guy who was with the... Uh, was with the Harlem Renaissance, and he said, it's really wonderful here in Fez with the bowls. Jane is hard at work on finishing a long story, and Paul just finished a novel. I'm just resting and seeing the sights. Best regards, Oliver. But you know, I don't know, it's just there's something about Oliver that when we were students, we'll talk more about this, but yeah, maybe he was conceited. I mean, I rem Hilda Stark just told me a story that when she first went to, his, uh, to work for him as an assistant, when she was a student, right after being a student, she said she went and she took the subway out to Brooklyn and she said to Oliver, well, isn't it hard for you to take a subway home at night after the shows? Aren't you afraid of being on the subway? Because this is, of course, in the, the 80s when we lived there. And he said, my dear, national treasures do not take the subway. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, that's how we feel about him. I hope that's how you're gonna feel about him. And now, um, I, just wanna, I just wanna say that I'm really open to people who knew Oliver if you're here. And I'm going to make Steve speak, and I'm going to make Peter speak. So if there's anyone else, please let me know if you're here and if you work with him. Uh, you know, uh, I think that we all feel a special connection. And I don't know, it's hard to remember some things, but then I remember everything else. The very first moment I met him, I was a first year in the plumbing warehouse down on 6th Street. And it was the design show. And we didn't get him in our first year. And I remember that he threw his coat at me because I was running the coat check. And I just remember the smell of this Tweety jacket with cigarettes, and it was just Oliver, and it was, it was so visceral. And, uh, you know, so I, I really feel like, uh, even in reading a lot of this stuff, that he influenced us more than we know. So the bandwagon, uh, again, watch for the ballet sequence, because it is a very tongue-in-cheek joke on the style of ballet then, and, 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 uh, and also watch for the theater sequence, where they're talking about the plans and that they can't fit everything in the theater. The theater they used was at MGM, it was the Phantom of the Opera Theater, and it's actually used for both theaters. And uh, what else can I tell about it? It was, I don't know, bandwagon, it's just like this, oh, and there's a missing sequence from the bandwagon you're gonna see, which is called Two-Faced Woman. And it's in the, uh, uh, the very end of it is in the cut of the movie, but I've restored it in this clip. And, and you can tell Oliver's style because it's scenery that you could only do on stage and, and this is a stage version of it, that, that transmorphs in a way that only if you understood that Oliver was a master of, of scene design, going from scene to scene to scene, that you understand how it works so perfectly with the choreography. So those are some little things. Then I'm gonna bring up our panel, we'll talk and we'll talk more. So if you wanna go ahead and run the clips from the bandwagon. I'm sorry, are you gonna lower these so they're not in the way? Okay, great, thanks.